This week to be closer to China, the world has been undergoing extraordinary changes unseen in a century, and the core of China's diplomatic work is Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy. So Xi Jinping of thought on diplomacy was trying to put its uh, tasks uh, was, uh, as, as a combination of domestic agendas and international, and, uh, international aims. What is Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy? How does it affect China's relations with major powers, neighboring countries, and developing countries? China provide huge opportunities for the rest of the world. Because China's economy, if you want to proceed, we want to have, we need to have world peace stability. We need and we must have regional stability. And with China's increasing engagement in global affairs, while President Xi's grand vision is to build a shared future for humanity, concerns about a China threat have been raised. This week, explore Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy to be closer to China. I am struck by the breadth and scope of China's engagement with the world. There is now no matter of global importance in which China does not participate. Moreover, China's diplomacy is increasingly proactive. The country is no longer content merely to respond to external events, circumstances, and pressures. It wasn't always this way. At different times, under different leaders, China's diplomatic positioning varied. What were the phases or epochs of China's diplomacy from 1949 to 2019? How to understand China's diplomatic transformation since 2012 when Xi Jinping became China's senior leader, including the vision of a community of shared future for humanity and the Belt and Road Initiative. Why is Xi setting such a grand vision of global governance? Why is she elevating the party in China's foreign affairs? In short, what is Xi Jinping's thought on diplomacy? And what is its impact on China and on the world? What are its basic principles, its key components, its practical consequences? Why do some see China's emergence as a diplomatic actor as disrupting, even though China promotes joint consultation, win-win cooperation, and shared benefits? China's diplomacy brings us closer to China. 2019 marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, and we have witnessed the country's remarkable economic and social development. Yet of late, the world has been undergoing extraordinary changes unseen in a century, and Chinese diplomacy has had to adapt to this new era. At the Central Conference on Work Relating to Foreign Affairs in June 2018, Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy was established as the fundamental guideline for China's diplomatic work. How to understand and appreciate the logic of Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy, which is an essential part of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. What are its core concepts and overarching goals? What can we say now, looking backwards on all these different ideas, how Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy organizes it. How does that big um, umbrella capture all of the different ideas in a coherent manner? Personally, I think we need to understand it from three aspects. The first is a thought of a community with a shared future for mankind. Second, a new type of international relations. Its essence is a new type of relations between China and the rest of the world. Third, to strengthen the party's overall leadership in foreign affairs. President Xi Jinping believes that compared to the past, from the Second World War to today's growth, the world is getting unprecedentedly more independent and connected. Economic globalization has, in fact, linked the whole world together. We all have a stake in each other. 
For instance, you fly to China and to other places from China. It is a smaller world today. It used to be very difficult for me to see you, but today I can reach you through WeChat or a visual telephone. The U.S. also depends on globalization. The U.S. needs China. Without China, the U.S. cannot be great again. China cannot be great without the U.S. It is a reality. With President Xi Jinping's concept, it is a so-called community with a shared future for mankind. Second, a new type of international relations is particular with a new type of relations between major countries, that is, how major powers coexist with each other. The Western experience is that a rising power would definitely bring down an established power. This is about the Thucydides trap. What does the Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy intend to fix? That is, we don't like to fall into the Thucydides trap. Instead, in this global village, and interdependent and interrelated countries, we seek cooperation and win-win. For China's diplomacy to add more certainty to the world, the CPC's leadership represents a crucial factor. In fact, it is to add some certainty in the world. Today, more entities are involved in foreign affairs, including government, civil society, and companies, among others. Foreign affairs involve diverse participants. Given that, how can Chinese diplomatic policies be fulfilled? It is critical to have a core leadership that forms a synergy. A strengthened party leadership is crucial to translating our promises on international responsibilities and obligations into reality. Some countries simply pay lip service. Why can China walk the talk? Because our party's leadership has a significant role to play. As the third decade of the 21st century is about to begin, China faces new uncertainties in its external environment. Trade and other frictions between China and the U.S. have been increasing. Recently, Chinese companies have stopped purchasing U.S. agricultural products in response to President Trump's new 10% tariffs on $300 billion worth of Chinese goods set to start on September 1st. On August 6th, the DPRK, North Korea, fired projectiles off its east coast, the fourth such launch in less than two weeks. China again called for dialogue to resolve the North Korean nuclear crisis and promote denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Moreover, China is involved in territorial disputes in the South China Sea, with overlapping claims among neighboring countries, including Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia. Is China's actions aggressive or responsible? Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy is said to provide guidance on furthering China's foreign relations, including with major powers, neighboring countries, and developing countries. So how does a sophisticated diplomatic strategy handle these diverse and complex situations? Over the last couple of years, there has really been a shift among politicians, think tank experts, uh, people who follow China, uh, fairly dramatically to um, a feeling that, that the, the long future is not a cooperative partnership, but more a strategic competition, uh, which is a vastly different perspective. Um, and, and so how, how do you address that? when you see this, uh, what we call a sea change in the U.S. from uh, hopefully a co-op cooperative partnership to strategic competition. The U.S. has indeed changed its perception of China, but I think it is worth discussing whether such changes are in line with U.S. interests. Since 2000, when China joined the international system and realized national growth with opportunities provided by globalization, the U.S. is a country that is always prepared for potential dangers, has witnessed such a change, and treats China more like a rival than a partner. Economic and trade links between China and the U.S. are quite strong. If they see China as an enemy or rival, they would no doubt treat us the way they treat an enemy or rival, including trade frictions between China and the U.S. 
and issues involving Taiwan. This would affect Sino-U.S. relations in a profound way. It is a paradox for the U.S. The U.S. believes China imposes greater competitive pressure on it because in the process of economic globalization, the U.S. faces more economic difficulties, not as strong as it used to be. Given that, the U.S. sees China as a rival. If you want to make the U.S. great again, however, would such a practice serve that goal? Here, I want to stress again that economic globalization is an objective law not something that can be reversed by someone. It is a flow of personnel, materials and capital, an objective trend independent of people's wishes and also a reflection of a law on how things develop. If the U.S. defines China like that, for instance, by increasing tariffs on Chinese products, could that balance its temporary interests and long-term interests? Not necessarily. Many experts and scholars have written to President Trump to reflect on U.S. policy. I believe Sino-U.S. cooperation serves both countries. It is not rhetoric. President Trump is also a businessman. He knows the importance of cooperation. What if the global chain really breaks? In that case, China and the U.S. would not be the only ones to suffer. How does China deal with that in a way that builds China's uh, a global interest in the long term so that China, which has said it never wants to become a, a, a hegemon country, uh, but yet at the same time will not um, give up any of its rightful core interests in its own territory itself when you have these multiple things. How, how, does, how does a sophisticated diplomacy handle those situations? There are some people who talk about this um, uh, land uh, reclamation, because the uh, the island is now in uh, Philippine Filipino occupation. The only way uh, taking the the island back, probably you have to do it through force. That's not something China want. And it seems that the Duterte uh, stretched out a friendly hand. Mm. China embraced him with a big, uh, big, big hug. And uh, China and the Philippines had a friendly consultation and had uh, worked out some economic cooperative programs. And then if we move uh, this, uh, uh, the focus upward, of course, Taiwan is always uh, a, a, a different situation because China always regards Taiwan as uh, one of our core interests. Even now, uh, uh, it's not going to be uh, mixed with other uh, like regional uh, issues. Uh, because even for U.S.-China relations, Taiwan relations is regarded as one of the, uh, the red lines in a, in a bilateral relationship. If we move up, Korean Peninsula, China's policies are three-pronged. Number one, denuclearization, period. Number two, future prosperity, peace, the stability in the region. Number three, how to realize those goals through diplomatic and non-military means. And China and the U.S. has a certain convergence of interests regarding the Korean Peninsula settlement. And uh, denuclearization is what the U.S. and China both want. But on the third point, China says that the peaceful means only. U.S. says, well, all options are mm -hmm. on the table. Uh, uh, now you can see that uh, through uh, diplomatic consultation, in, uh, there has been tremendous improvement of China's relations with the northern part of the peninsula. There was once the third issue, uh, but now the relationship has been uh, back to normal, so to speak. Because China's economy, if we want to proceed, we want to have, uh, we need to have world peace, stability. We need and we must have 
regional stability. The foreign critics would say that whereas China might not want to take over the whole world, which is kind of silly, they do want ultimately to have, if not a hegemony on its borders, at least the dominant players so that the, all of these border areas would be resolved in China's favor. China will not take over the world. We are not capable of doing that. With 1.4 billion Chinese people, we have a lot of things to do on our own. We know we are uh, still a developing country. We have a long way to go to, to satisfy uh, the demand and the um, design to make a, uh, to, to, to enjoy a, a better and happy life. We have never had an intention to be a number one or to play a, uh, a key role in all this uh, global governance. Uh, we think we can play a constructive role. We can, we can play a positive role. China is not a threat. China provides huge opportunities for the rest of the world. The more we develop, the bigger our economy would be the big contribution we'll make to the world. I think that's something they have to understand. I, as, a, as someone which come from a very poor areas in the Chinese uh, Western part, I, I have a full understanding of uh, how many poor people still are in China and how long we have to go to make China really strong. And uh, so we, we, uh, we had, we, we have many people very rational, uh, very sensitive to the poverty and uh, many problems we are still facing. And uh, uh, our concentration always on how we can resolve those domestic issues instead of how we can become a, uh, a, a number one or a, a bigger superpower in this world. For China to take the path of peaceful development, others should also take this path. What would it be like if only China takes a peaceful road? If we encounter a road which deals a staggering blow to us, are we supposed to hit back? As for the development path, it is not only China to take the peaceful road, but for others as well. If we all walk toward the same direction, solutions will probably be found. Otherwise, if we all follow our own ways and only prioritize and pursue our self-interests, solutions would always be elusive. President Xi made the remarks at the closing ceremony of the Global Governance Forum in Paris, co-hosted by China and France. He urged all countries to make concerted efforts and jointly shape the future of humankind in the face of severe global challenges. To fulfill President Xi's grand vision of building a shared future for all humanity, the Belt and Road Initiative plays a critical part in promoting interconnectedness and equality, especially by constructing infrastructure in developing countries. The joint pursuit of the Belt and Road Initiative aims to enhance connectivity and practical cooperation it's about jointly meeting the various challenges and risks confronting mankind and deliver win-win outcomes and common development. Win-win means both sides win. What benefits does China gain from the Belt and Road Initiative? However, with China's increasing engagement in global affairs, some remain skeptical of China being a responsible nation. Hence, concerns about a China threat are raised. Is China really a threat to the world? In 2012, the General Secretary in his report to the 18th National Party Congress said that China would act as a responsible stakeholder in global governance. This was for the first time in party documents when a responsible stakeholder was proposed. In the 13th Five-Year Plan, a whole chapter was devoted to actively assuming international responsibilities and obligations which had never appeared in previous five-year plans. These reflected our perception of China's changing status. We are positioned to take some international responsibility. The concern of a China threat, so what can China do to allay these kinds of concerns? 
I remember when I uh, took graduate courses in the, in the, back in the States, one professor was telling me that when you look at a politician speak, do not look at his mouth. Judge, watch his butts, <laughs> where, where he sits, where he stands. It seems that uh, when you look at uh, the participants of the Belt and Road, I would say that uh, most people who have uh, participated have felt that uh, something tangible in their hand. People ask uh, who, who is the, uh, uh, the third largest uh, producer of fiberglass. And if I, may, if I tell you that it's Egypt, people probably will feel surprised because n nobody would probably think that Egypt would be the largest, the third largest supplier in the whole world of fiberglass because China's uh, big uh, great stone company set up a factory there. It, uh, it's a win-win situation between China apparently and uh, the local uh, the people and, and between China and Egypt. As such, China says that uh, Belt and Road is not a solo on the part of China. China's vision of a global community with a shared future for all humanity is certainly um, attractive for everyone, but people ask what is the benefit for China? And in specific, the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, undoubtedly is extraordinarily important for developing countries, uh, one could argue it's the most important thing they need, and therefore China's um, expertise in, um, in building infrastructure is uh, enormously valuable. But, but what's the benefit for China? Uh, people, people are suspicious if China says that everything it's doing is for the benefit of the world. Uh, everybody does first what's benefit for themselves. So in terms of the global community with a shared future, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, how does China benefit from the success of this? China's development pursues a virtuous interaction between China and the rest of the world. The Belt and Road Initiative focuses on interconnectivity. Why are we so interested in the interconnectivity of roads? It is based on our Chinese experience. There is a saying which goes, if you want to get rich, build roads first. With well-connected roads, when we export our Chinese products, the costs will drop. Chinese products are finding a way out. Over the past 40 years of reform and opening up, we mainly focus on bringing in. Now, with a great variety of products, we must find markets in the global community. In terms of the industrial chain, what countries are desirable markets for Chinese products? Most Chinese products are more desirable in developing countries, not the U.S., a market for more high-end products. That is why the Belt and Road Initiative involves more developing countries by helping them improve transportation and infrastructure. It helps China to develop ties with those countries, including doing business and encouraging entrepreneurs to go global. We intend to foster a virtuous circle between China and the rest of the world to grow together. Today's unbalanced world is a result of unbalanced and inadequate growth of developing countries. If they can grow strong, we may embrace a bigger global market with higher consumption capabilities and broader growth space, which is good for China, the U.S. and other countries. That is the starting point of the Belt and Road Initiative. President Xi stresses that diplomatic work should take national rejuvenation and promoting world peace and common development as its main tasks, strive to build a community with a shared future for humanity, and firmly safeguard the country's sovereignty, security, and development interests. Coordinating and balancing this big vision with individual bilateral relations while protecting China's own interests can require thoughtful, careful work. China's diplomatic vision are these big ideas of global governance, multilateralism, uh, but in fact the process of diplomacy is very much bilateral. China has bilateral relations with the U.S., with Russia, with India, with Japan, uh, with countries all over the world, each of which has different kinds of interests. So globally speaking, how do you 
coordinate that um, from the uh, overarching view of, of China's uh, diplomatic leadership. How do you coordinate the big vision with the individual bilateral relationships? At the bilateral level, there are also issues about rules. For each bilateral relation, mutual concerns will be resolved through consultations. Surely, rules governing bilateral relations are not supposed to contradict the norms of international rules. They should be aligned. In a nutshell, Xi Jinping's uh, diplomacy in the, for the new era is that we want to maintain uh, cooperation and the consultation in all uh, four uh, areas, maintaining uh, in the first place uh, uh, consultation and the stable relations with the major world powers, United States, Russia, Europe, and so on. The second area is that China needs to have a, a fraternal, good, reliable neighbor passes. And the third uh, area is uh, relationship with other developing countries. China needs to enhance relations, contacts. Uh, the last but not least is uh, uh, multi-diplomacy. And in the United Nations, uh, uh, World Bank, and the AIIB, and the Asia Development Bank, China wants to make as many partners as possible. How to understand Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy? One way is three big concepts. A community of shared future for all humanity, a new kind of big power relationship, and the enhanced role of the party in running foreign affairs. Another way is eight big ideas. Community of shared future, win-win cooperation, economic globalization, new kind of global governance, new kind of big power relationship, expanding cooperation while managing differences, multilateralism and democratization of international relations, and people-to-people -people exchanges. While in its early years the People's Republic promoted communist revolutions and had a quasi yet troubled alliance with the Soviet Union, by the early 1980s, China adopted an independent foreign policy with the stated goals of safeguarding world peace, opposing all forms of hegemony, and achieving economic modernization and national rejuvenation. It made sense. China needs a stable international environment to enable domestic development. Although today it would be a mistake to view China's diplomacy through the lens of U.S.-China frictions, China's diplomatic objective is to protect its three sacrosanct core interests, its political system, continuing economic development, and national sovereignty, territorial integrity. But President Xi also recognizes China's global responsibilities. Moreover, China's peaceful rise enhances global standards of living. The big question remains open. China at mid-century moving towards center stage of the world. Will China assume the responsibilities and bear the burdens? And what then will be the China threat? That's closer to China.